If you're an artist and you want to be authentic in your art at some point, you're going to have to deal with the challenge of depicting evil. And if you're a Christian, you have to ask yourself, how do I depict evil and protect my heart and mind in the process? There are real benefits. We need to depict evil, but there are real concerns. So let's get to it and discuss key principles for portraying evil in your art. Welcome. I'm Joel Pelsu, president of Arts Entertainment Ministries, where we mentor artists and creative professionals to succeed creatively and grow spiritually at the same time. If God's called you into a creative career, you need to know you're not alone. God is with you, and we have created videos, blogs, and online courses created just for you. And you can find them by using the links down below. You may wonder, why do we do this? We do this to encourage and equip you so you have confidence working as a Christian in the art world, media, or entertainment industry. Whether you live in a small market, you work remotely, as many friends do, or if you live and work in a major market like here in LA, New York, London, and so on. Now, before we jump in, I want to thank you for taking time to watch this video and ask one favor. Take a second, you know what to do, hit the like button, subscribe to our channel. It really does help other people find this content and helps us. It makes a difference. Now, the simple truth is this. There is evil in the world. It's real. We can't ignore it. Yet we should be careful to not glorify it either. If we don't depict evil realistically and honestly, the audience will sense something is missing and dismiss our work as naive or shallow. But once we commit to depicting evil authentically, there are other dangers we face, other challenges and dangers. And there's two dangers I want to talk about first off. First, there's the danger of our hearts becoming enamored with the cunning, attractive, and seductive nature of evil, not unlike the original snake in the garden tempting Adam and Eve, luring us in to see their viewpoint. Second, there's a danger of glamorizing evil and leading your audience to be seduced by the nature of evil based on how you portray it. The key issue here is using scripture as our model for depicting evil. See, scripture does not avoid the reality of evil and all the tragic actions of evil men and women. And the great example is the evil done by Jezebel, the infamous wife, to the king Ahab of Samaria, and the violent judgment upon them, which was prophesied and fulfilled. Now, there's no bedtime story for little children. This is graphic and disturbing. When you're reading through the Bible with an 8-year-old, 10-year-old, you may be tempted to skip these passages. If it was made into a film, we might expect Martin Scorsese or Quentin Tarantino to do the fitting job of depicting this violence. So, let me just set the stage for this story. So first, the king wanted to buy a vineyard from his neighbor, Naboth. But Naboth wasn't interested. It's his family's vineyard. He doesn't want to give it up. So the king was sulking. He wanted this vineyard so much. He was sulking because he didn't get this vineyard. When his wife saw him, his wife is Jezebel, he was sulking, basically told her, this is, this is my problem, this is my frustration. And she said, don't worry about it. So she forged the king's signature, made a decree look like it was from the king. And this is what the Bible tells us. It says, quote, Two worthless men are to bring a charge against Naboth, saying, He has cursed God and the king. You've cursed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. And they did exactly what she wanted. They lied, betrayed Naboth, and killed him. 1 Kings 21, verses 9 through 11. And 1 Kings tells us this, As soon as Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money, for Naboth is not alive, but dead. Who knew? This is amazing. Doesn't tell him she basically had him killed. And as soon as Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, he didn't grieve, he didn't mourn. He went right down to the vineyard of Naboth and took possession of it. The king didn't ask how Naboth died or anything like that. He just went right down to get the vineyard he wanted. So here we see the Bible depicting sin, jealousy, betrayal, bribery, theft, abuse of power, and murder. The Bible's not afraid to depict the nature of sin and evil. It is part of the human condition. But what happened to Jezebel? Verses 23 and 24 of Jezebel, the Lord also said, The dogs shall devour Jezebel within the walls of Jezreel. Now, for people who object to depicting violence and equivocate scripture with something like a bedtime story full of nice, lovely endings, you're in for a rude awakening. We read the fulfillment of this prophecy in 2 Kings 9, verses 35 to 37, 
When they went to bury her, they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Not even the whole hand. When they came back and told him, Jehu, he said, This is the word of the Lord. The dog shall eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the corpse of Jezebel shall be as dung on the face of the field, so that no one can say, even look and go there, this is Jezebel. Now ponder what the writer of 2 Kings is saying. A body so trampled on and devoured by dogs that there isn't even enough of a person for anyone to recognize this was Jezebel. This is graphic and violent. And yet God, in his great wisdom, ordained that this story should be told to you and I. So we know evil done by Jezebel and the violent, just judgment of God upon her for what she did. You see, God hates evil. And he inspired his prophets throughout scripture and the writers of scripture to expose evil deeds of his own people as well as of others. This brings us to the point of what God is telling us in scripture. And so we need to take a look at the grand story of scripture, the entire arc of the Bible. You see, the grand narrative of scripture could not be told without the reality of sin and evil. From the very first book of the Bible, we see original sin in Genesis. Even living in an idyllic garden, they betrayed God's trust and chose to do the one thing they were commanded not to do. And this is followed right away with Cain killing his own brother, Abel. Murder right away. And all the way through the Bible until God brings justice and resolution in the story in the book of Revelation. If you wanted to cut out every part of the Bible that referenced evil, you'd have to do major surgery, ripping out entire pages all over the place. In fact, the cross where Christ died depicts the very consequences of sin and evil. It's graphic. All of it poured out upon Jesus. It's the ultimate moment where we see the consequences of sin and evil. And at the same time, we see the hope we have to overcome evil and the evil one through faith in Christ. It is both grotesque and beautiful spiritually, grotesque physically, beautiful spiritually in what Christ is willing to do to sacrifice out of love for us, even while the enemy is pouring, pouring out all this judgment and evil, grotesque abuse upon the body of Christ. You see, to make squeaky clean art for little children may be fine, but as they grow up, they realize there's evil in the world. Artwork and creative expressions are gifts from God to help us explain the nature of life. This must include evil, as well as the hope we have in God to overcome evil. See, it's theologically dangerous and even heretical to avoid the topic of evil. You can't tell the story of Scripture without evil and sin. To pretend evil isn't significant would be to pretend there's no great danger of sin, and Jesus shouldn't have had to die to save us from it. It's no big deal. And this brings us to the practical question of how do we depict evil? One of the great examples is C.S. Lewis and his bestseller, Screwtape Letters. You see, C.S. Lewis had a genius idea. Take the time to get inside the mind of how a demon might think and portray the antics and strategies for neutralizing and discouraging the faith of Christians. So he's imagining how they might be deceived, how demons might discourage Christians in their Christian walk. And there's a tremendous success. This book still sells over 100,000 copies each year. If you haven't read it, Buy it, read it, it will be a blessing to you. But it didn't come without a cost. It pushed Lewis into a depression of sorts after writing it. You see, there was a toll on his soul in the process. And he said, though I have never written anything more easily, I never wrote with less enjoyment. It took a toll on his soul. Now, portraying evil has different challenges for different artists working in different mediums. You can't get one principle and just lap it on all creatives. It just doesn't work that way. You know, visual artists, if they're painting a, a portrayal of some evil act, that's challenging to be honest, but it's not internal. It's not like an actor or an actress depicting an evil character authentically and yet trying to guard their heart. That's a much more intimate challenge for the actor. There's a deeper need for them to embody and express the particular aspects of evil or the motivations of evil characters, in order to communicate evil authentically to the audience. And writers are directors. It's not quite like an actor, but they have a challenge as they imagine. How do I create the world in which evil exists and is authentic and real? How much do they include or exclude to make the story powerful 
without becoming salacious. A lot of creative choices in there and challenges. But no matter your medium, the challenge is this. First, it's guarding your heart. Now, excellence in your craft does not exempt you from temptation. Whatever you contemplate can have an impact on your desires. Don't fool yourself. Don't kid yourself. It can open you up to temptation. Whether you're a writer who's writing a documentary exposing sex trafficking, or an actor portraying the dark life of a mafia boss, there's a need to guard your heart, that you don't fully get into that mindset and entertain ideas and thoughts that just aren't healthy. Now, these dark places include maybe the exploration of psychotic behavior, abusive relationships for both the abuser and the victim. And if you've been abused, it can trigger things inside you. So you've got to be careful about this. You know, Proverbs 4.23 tells us, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. This also means guarding your imagination. Proverbs 22, verses 24 and 25 tell us, Make no friendship with a man given to anger, nor go with a wrathful man, lest you learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. The simple truth is this, I want to get from this passage, we become like those we spend time with. When you're writing about a character or acting a role or you're spending time with that character, just as C.S. Lewis did when he wrote Screwtape Letters, you may be doing this all for a worthwhile project, unaware of what could happen. It's for a wonderful, noble idea, but that will never eliminate the need for you to care about the impact on your soul. And avoiding this doesn't help anyone. Our primary goal cannot be avoidance of these issues, lest we avoid living altogether. Christ did not die to take us out of the world and condemn the world, John 3.17. So many people read John 3.16, they never go to the next verse, 3.17. Jesus wants to protect us from the evil one, even though we live in this evil world and navigating the dangers of this life. So we can't avoid these topics, but we need to guard our imagination. And this brings us to the issue of wisdom and technique. See, many great acting coaches and teachers were phenomenal about creating performances that were just amazing much more graphic and emotionally engaging than anything before, but these professors weren't great about creating healthy men and women who were those actors. Lee Strasberg's method acting technique, which is loosely based on Stanislavski, is of particular interest at this point because it takes an extreme toll on the actors. There's an article in New York Magazine by author Richard Brody, and he states, there's something about modern day acting, the style that is famously associated with Lee Strasberg's method, and that gained currency from its actor studio in New York, its offshoots, that inclines toward deformations of character. Actors who choose to stay in character not only between takes, but for the entire time they're shooting a film, or playing a role in a play on Broadway, or elsewhere, even when they're not rehearsing or recording, this is what the method acting is. This means they may embody the life of an evil person for weeks or months. Daniel Day-Lewis is famous for using this approach, in fact, he doesn't know how other actors can go in and out of character. He remains in character the entire time he's shooting a film. He shoots during day, that evening at dinner, at night, the morning. He is trying to live that life. And this introduces the challenge of taking your work home with you. As an actor, you're taking work home with you, but this is not paperwork. This is motives, mindsets, desires that animate your character. This is why method acting can be more dangerous when you're playing evil characters. The more you allow your mind to consider evil choices, the more you break down the God-given natural aversion we all have to heinous thoughts, crimes, and sins. In fact, the more familiar we become, the less heinous they would seem to the actor. And ideas of depression or frustration or evil that you would never have considered, all of a sudden you've entertained. And so like that proverb, hanging out with an angry man, you become like him. You're hanging out with this character day in, day out. The temptation is to open yourself up more and more to embracing the viewpoints, whether it's in little pieces or in large measure, of that character. And many have wondered how much Heath Ledger was affected by the roles he chose. In particular, the role of Joker, which embraced a lot of chaos in the film of Dark Knight, after which, sadly, he committed suicide. So talented, sad to see anyone do this. And this is not new. Even if we look to early Hollywood, we can see the effects upon Vivian Lee as she played Blanche Dubois in Streetcar Named Desire. Vivian said that playing such a difficult role on stage and in the movie almost made her go insane. 
She acknowledged there were serious dangers to her personal and mental health because of this method acting. My wife, who trained under teachers from each of the great acting schools, discusses this more in length in our Arts Entertainment Institute. I will leave a link to that down below. It's a very important issue for actors and actresses to understand. See, to give a contrast, method acting is probably the worst, while Uta Hagen and other hybrid approaches provide a much healthier approach to acting, so you can start to guard your heart, but still be giving authentic depictions in the way you act. But check out the Institute in the link down below and you can get those details. This brings us to the practical tools you need while depicting evil. You need to tend to your heart. No matter the type of art you create, be intentional about tending to your heart. How do you do that? First, remain anchored in God's Word. As Jesus reminded us in John 15, we must remain in the vine if we want to live a fruitful and healthy spiritual life. That requires reading the Word, seeking intimacy with Christ through prayer, and growing in our love for Jesus. That needs to be a main focus. So we are focused on that, not on all these other dynamics and these scripts and everything else we're doing artistically. Second, remain anchored in God's community. Proverbs tells us that wisdom is found in the company of many. Don't make critical decisions alone. Galatians 6 and other passages remind us that we need to care for one another and watch out for each other. You're not designed to do this alone. When we're alone, we find it easier to rationalize our choices and to make poor decisions. It just works that way. So remain anchored in godly community. Third, recognize your personal weaknesses. It's not the same for everyone, and that's why we never give a list of do's and don'ts. It's not that simple. Consider your own emotional, physical, spiritual fragility. Don't walk into every situation assuming that you have no weaknesses. That is the way to play the fool. See, Psalm 139 reminds us to be like David, asking God, Search me, Father, know my heart, try my mind. If there be any wicked way within me, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Show me who I am and what my temptations are and how to lean on you. Once you tend to your heart, look out and ask yourself, How am I caring for my audience? You see, a healthy portrayal of evil will create a longing for virtues like justice and love, truth, honesty, fidelity. An unhealthy portrayal of evil will encourage responses of evil like vengeance, promiscuity, vigilantism, blasphemy. You see, the question we'd ask is this. How does your current project contribute to a healthy or unhealthy view of evil? When evil leads to redemption, we can easily see how it echoes the stories of the Bible. There's hope and there's forgiveness. And when evil leads to tragedy, it can also be healthy because it demonstrates the judgment of God and the consequences of sin, just like with Jezebel. But without context, you're just giving evil the last word, which is never biblical. God has the last word, and it is He is victorious. He redeems His people and brings judgment upon the wicked. So there you have it. You have freedom in Christ to depict evil. That's the arc of Scripture. There is evil, but God has come and He has overcome evil. So you have freedom to portray evil. The question is just how do you guard your heart, guard your imagination, and consider how it can impact your audience. Now, I want to ask you a favor. Can you share down below? How have you depicted evil in your art? Did it bother you? Did it take a toll on you? Or have you depicted evil and really felt like you honored God in how you depicted it? I would love to read those in the comments, so post those stories down below. As always, thank you for taking the time to watch this video. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Always check the links down below to learn about our online courses. And don't forget, give me those comments about depicting evil in your artwork, video games, films, whatever other kind of creative endeavor you are engaged in. Thanks for watching this video. Have a great day, and God bless.